But uh, here's this word from Mark. And I have heard this, this scripture, this story, this teaching hundreds of times before. I've preached on it. And you've probably heard it too. But I heard it, I read it, and I understand it in a whole new way now. So hear this word of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. And he asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now understand what he's asking for. What must I do to be in the presence of God forever? What must I do to be in God's favor? What must I do to be in good standing with God? That's all wrapped up in this, in good standing so I, you know, in this life and when I die. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God. However, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And the man said, teacher, I have kept all of these since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and Jesus loved him. That's important. Jesus said to him in love, not sarcastically, not meanly. Jesus loved him and said, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. As I said before, I never really understood this scripture until I had the privilege of being able to go to Nigeria. Really. This week, I looked back through my journal, and I was trying to figure out, where do I start? There were so many wonderful, amazing, godly experiences that I had, and I know our team had while in Nigeria in a third world country. There were so many places that said, where do I start? How do I limit this? And, and, and this is the area I thought about. I thought about this passage um, uh, because I see it differently differently than I ever have before. Yes, this passage, this scripture lesson is about priorities. Absolutely it is. It's about getting our priorities straight. Yes. It's about generosity. Yes. About real generosity. Yes. And it's also, and this is what I really saw for the first time in a deep, deep way. It's also about spiritual maturity. Now, spiritual maturity, those two words are, are a way to sum up uh, spiritual maturity, our faith life, our, our connection to God, our practice of the Christian lifestyle, our practice seven days a week, practice of the Christian lifestyle. That's spiritual maturity. That our, as we grow more mature in, 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 as Christians and Christ followers, that's what I mean. This is about spiritual maturity. I realize that this lesson from Jesus is about how following Jesus and knowing the presence of God, feeling the presence of God, having that, that involves more, folks, than just having Christian listed on the resume. Are you with me? I realize that what Jesus is pointing to is something deeper. It's about something that's deeper and more meaningful than just having your name written in some church's membership book. Anybody can do that. This is about spiritual maturity. It's deeper. It's Jesus teaching about uh, authentic, authentic spiritual maturity. I think of it like this. When it comes to the practice of things like generosity and the practice of where, where we spend our time, what we've, what we've talked about here before at Grandview, our checkbook and our date book, spiritual maturity, what Jesus is pointing to, understand it like this. He's pointing to that difference between have to and want to. And that's an important point to keep in mind this morning as I go on. Jesus is talking about have to versus want to. Now, when you look at that gospel lesson, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, I have to agree, this always has seemed punitive. It seems burdensome, like a burdensome condition, like a precondition. You want to know the presence of God? You've got to sell all your stuff. And like most preachers through the years, I've really been troubled by this, and I've had to dance around it, though I've made an honest, honest attempt to interpret it and understand it for my congregation and for myself, but I've had to kind of, like a lot of other preachers, kind of fudge it going, well, I don't think he was talking to us. <laughs> he was just talking to the rich people. He was talking to Donald Trump. No, 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 no. No, I, I understand it differently now. See, I was not seeing the deeper meaning of this gospel lesson. I was not seeing the deeper meaning. I was looking at this as an unrealistic burden. I was looking at Jesus' instruction that we have to be generous we have to be crazy generous. We have to be unrealistically, audaciously generous. I was looking at that as a have to. But what I now understand after spending time with Christians in Nigeria who are absolutely on fire, on fire 
in their love of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ and advancing the gospel, when, when I've spent time with them, it's like, oh, the light bulb got a little brighter. And I see that Jesus is, what Jesus is pointing to is about spiritual maturity and about moving to a point in our relationship with, with God through Jesus Christ that we want to be generous. You all see that? That's what we're aiming for. It's not a have to. It's a want to that we see all of our possessions, that we see our valuables, and that includes our time, checkbook, date book, that we see all of our possess possessions and valuables in a different light, than that, that when we are in that deep, meaningful, authentic relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and as we grow more mature spiritually, we will want to give to God, not have to. You all making sense of that with me? You with me? Okay. See... That's how I see this. Jesus is saying, if you are really sold out, if you are really all in, all in, if you truly really are all in to this lifestyle, then letting go of money and letting go of possessions and letting go of your calendar, you know, where you spend your time, and giving to others in the name of God is not burdensome. That's what I believe Jesus is saying to the rich young man and saying to us. Amen? It's not burdensome. If you're sold out and truly all in, it's not burdensome. Here's another way to understand it. I think the mistake has been that we look at this scripture of the rich young, young man and Jesus uh, teaching and talking to him, as, we've looked at it like a magic formula, or we've looked at it as a, a cover charge or a ticket price to get into the presence of God. Like, you've got to pay the price, you've got to pay the price, you've got to give till it hurts, and I, I, don't, I don't see it that way anymore. This, this sold out, on fire uh, for, for the Christian lifestyle, this desire, this desire to live out the gospel, that comes first. And then what happens as a result of that is that generosity and a, and a want to give to God, not have to. And I think that makes sense to me, and I hope it makes sense to you. Now listen, folks, when it comes to this scripture, here's something I absolutely believe to be true or I wouldn't tell you. And I believe this to be true, that Jesus Christ does not want us all to live hard, difficult lives of material poverty. I can't believe that. Not when I read Jesus saying things like, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. I've come to, 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 to take care of you, to do those things. I do not believe that Jesus wants us all to live hard, difficult lives of material poverty. I don't believe that. But listen, understand what Jesus does want. Jesus does want us to live lives rich in spiritual maturity. Make sense? What he does want is for us to live lives where we, we are wealthy in our spiritual maturity and our passion for God and our desire to know God more and to be in God's presence. That's what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to live lives like that and see what happens is that, that takes all of our possessions, all of our 401ks, our pension plans, our savings accounts, our house, our cars, all of our, our job, all the things that we, we find our identity in, and it puts, puts them second. You know, some of us still run around with that little bracelet on that says, I am second. Well, this is a variation of that. It's saying all that stuff is second. God, you're first. That's really what this is. And I understand it in a much, much better way. See, it came to me as I spent time with people in Nigeria. And we have over 2,000 pictures. So, I, I mean, I couldn't put them all on the screen today or we wouldn't go home until after lunch. Here's a few of the folks we spent time with. Up there is uh, Hanatu, there by the cross and flame. Powerful, powerful Christian woman, pastor, leader. She was our cook. You know, you talk about a humble woman, humble woman, we're there with all the big you know, dignitaries and everybody at this fancy meal, and, and, and we're thanking Hanatu for being our cook, and she said, yeah, you know, she's an ordained pastor, like me, she's an ordained pastor, she has a church, all this kind of stuff, but she said, you know what, I just pray to God that I can at least be a cook in the kingdom of heaven. That's humility. And this woman's on fire. And the more I was around her, and then these people down here in the lower right-hand corner, that's on Sunday morning, we had communion we had communion, and I was asked to preach, and uh, I wasn't prepared to preach, but you know what? I preached, <laughs> right? And Hanatu interpreted for me, and I had smuggled some Dubuque water over, even though it was another one of those cases where, you know, you got, you got to lie to the customs agents. You have any liquids in your carry-on? Nope, not a one. No liquids. We're all good. And coming back. You have any weapons? Uh-uh. No, I just got all these war clubs from, uh, <laughs> from Nigeria, but... Uh, um, we had water, and we took communion, and this is a sermon for another day. We took communion with all the folks 
underneath this tree, and we mixed the Dubuque water and the Nigerian water, the Damka water, we mixed that together because we had found out that Damka means to bring together and hold on to tightly. So we did, we did worship. Here's my point. The more I spent with these folks from Nigeria who are spiritually rich, folks, spiritually rich. See, you get around people like that, it's going to change you. You know, it's going to change you. We didn't, we, we went over there. If you're thinking we went to Nigeria, we went to Domke to change those people, eh, wrong answer. If you go next year, you will find out that they will change you. And they will change you because they are on fire for God and they love God and they are spiritually rich. They are hungry. They are hungry to know more about Jesus. They're hungry to know more about God. They're hungry for it. And they even have people like Boko Haram running around that want to kill them. You know, and they defiantly, unapologetically, unashamedly claim Christ. Where we were, we were in the middle of Muslim territory, and that was okay. It was okay. You know, we got the blessing from the chief and the warlord, and, and we're good. Point. These people are hungry, and they're, they're hungry for God. And, and, you know, according to our standards, according to our standards, they, they're poor. They're destitute. According to our material consumeristic standards, these folks in Nigeria are just poor destitute people. They don't no. Look, they don't consider themselves that way, folks. They have neighbors, they have family, they have clothes, they have food, they have friends, and most of all, the people that we met in Nigeria, they have hope because they have God. You with me? And you can't help but be impressed and changed by that. Let me tell you something. This church that we help build, Grandview, we help build this permanent structure church right out there on the edge of Muslim territory. We're loudly proclaiming, hey, Jesus is here, right? We've already outgrown it. There's a reason why we had to worship on Sunday morning underneath the tree. We've outgrown it. This is what's happening over in Nigeria. They can't build churches fast enough. They're just exploding. We would visit church after church. They'd say, well, we started with 300 people, and uh, now six, nine months later, we got 3,000. They are hungry. You get the point? They're on fire. And for our standards, they have nothing. But let me tell you what some of the Christian leaders told us. Quote, quote, Pastor Tom, things seem upside down. The Nigerian Christians are rich in faith and rich in spiritual passion, but we lack the means to build bigger churches. We lack the means to travel quickly and safely. We lack the means to always be safe in our villages and our cities. We lack those means, but when we look at you American Christians, we see that you have all the best resources, the best food and, and travel and air conditioning and ice and big, beautiful churches, but you lack spiritual passion. And you see, they're either confused or they're sad or they're angry of what we're doing to the brand, if you will. And they say in their words, Pastor Tom, things seem upside down. Yeah, and see, God said what? Be careful, my children. Be careful, my children, that you don't forget where you came from and who is responsible for your wealth and for your goodness. Be careful, God said to the Israelites, when you get your big houses built and you got plenty and your herds are big and you got money in the back bank, be careful. Don't forget me. You see where that has relevance for American Christianity. It's all true, by the way. And again, the Nigerian folks we met, the leaders, Christian leaders we met, are either sad or they're confused or they're disgusted. As Dr. Elmer Collier was here last week and he talked about consumer Christians. That's true. American Christianity, we got a lot of consumer Christians. We also have a lot of casual Christians. And we also have a lot of crybaby Christians. You know? Not, not, not necessarily a lot of folks that are on fire, absolutely, truly sold out. Consumer Christians, obviously, are those folks that shop around for the best deal in a church, right? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Will the pastor be nice? Will I like him? Does he dress okay? Does he tell funny jokes? Hmm? Or the, it, 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 what programs will be provided for me and my children? Will you have Sunday school so I can drop my kids off and go get a Starbucks? Will you have a confirmation? Will you have youth group? Consumer. It's like a good, right? It's like uh, this week I heard a story, um, sadly, and I saw it with a whole new light about uh, some parents talking about vacation Bible school and saying, well, what's the theme? What's the theme? Because and then I'll, you know, I'll ask my whatever six or seven-year-old, right, really? Really? 
hey, six, seven-year-old, now, can you want to go to Bible school or do you want to stay home and watch Netflix and play video games? Huh? Huh? And my question was, who's in charge in your household? Who's in charge? Consumer Christian. You know, I was, I found out this last week that we've been pushing, pushing, pushing vacation Bible school here at Grandview, and we got people lined up to do it, and we only had 20 registrations. And I was like, like, you know, you'd think I would have just been furious about that. I'm not furious about it. I'm embarrassed that a church this size only has 20 kids signed up for vacation Bible school. I'm embarrassed, especially in light of everything I've seen and everything I understand about consumer Christians as well as casual Christians, folks that are Christian only because they're not Buddhist or not Muslim or not atheist. They're Christians because they were born to parents that belong to a church. And so folks are kind of casual about it. Membership is equal. It's the same thing as being part of the Kiwanis or part of the Rotary Club. It's, it's not unique. It's not special. It's equal. And, and casual Christians will show up and, and attend if there's not something else going on, not something else. Casual Christians say, well, we kind of need a break from church. Really? Like a break from God? Really? And God said, be careful, my children, that you do not forget me. Be careful. And, of course, you have crybaby Christians, and that's just a more annoying version of consumer Christians. These are folks that complain and cry and whine and, and shout and give church a bad name, you know, because they say, hey, what have you done for me lately, pastor, staff, church? You're not playing the music I like. You, you know, it's too hot, too cold. You serve the wrong kind of coffee. Crybabies. And I, I compare and I contrast that to all these folks that we saw in Nigeria, that we saw in Nigeria that, as I said, are absolutely, positively on fire for the gospel. And I say, you know what? This isn't a shame on me. This isn't a shame on you. This isn't a shame on us. Aren't we bad? Folks, you know what my message to you this morning is in telling you all this? We can do better. That's it. And I put myself in that camp. We can do better. We, we worship, and we, we're, we worship an awesome God. We worship a God that, man, we love that God when we're in trouble. Amen? And Jesus says, and my children, you need to remember me when times are good as well. You are not your own God. We have so much that we take for granted, for sure. And look, here's, here's the thing. Spiritual maturity. Go back to that scripture. See, I know what I experienced. I know that I, know that, uh, I wanted to give away everything that I had to the people that I met. Not because I thought it would buy me favor with God. Not because I thought it was some kind of precondition to putting me into to God's presence and favor, but because, because I know that I took a step of spiritual maturity and I moved to that place of want to. You with me? I know what happened to me. I know that, man, my shirts, my, my, my Bibles, the pens, chapstick, sunblock, anything I had, I wanted to give it away and I wish I had more and that's when I got it. That's what Jesus was talking about. When we grow more spiritually mature, we want to be generous with all that we have. We want to be generous. We want to give God thanks and give God praise. So this morning, as we get ready to come down to this table, that's my challenge to all of us in this room. You don't have to go to Nigeria to have this experience. My challenge to all of us who take the name Christian is this. May God help us to grow more mature in our faith. May God help us to take advantage of all of the means that we have here in this church, just in Grandview. May God help us to take advantage of being part of cell groups and small groups and Bible studies and Sunday schools. May God help us to quit messing around and get our kids in here for vacation Bible school. May God help us to be here to worship. May God help us, is my point, to take advantage of all of the means all of the opportunities that we have to grow more faithful and to grow closer to God. This is what we need to pray about. And so let's just, let's just do that right now. Lord God, I pray that indeed that you will help us. I pray, Lord, that you will remove those barriers. That you will remove the things that stand in the way between us and you. I pray, Lord God, that you forgive us for forgetting. But Lord God, lift us up with hope today. Lift us up and remind us that we belong to you. We're special. We're your children. Remind us of that, Lord God, and help us to do better. In the name of Jesus. We give you this prayer, and, I, and we give you the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.